Welcome to Python Basics, Object-Oriented Programming. That's quite a hefty term. What does it even mean? Object-Oriented Programming is just a fancy way to say that you rely heavily on objects when writing code. Keep watching this course to find out what kind of objects we're talking about. Object-Oriented Programming makes coding easier. It doesn't really affect the end non-coding user. If your end user was a programmer and you were coding a library, then it would. Object-oriented programming also doesn't directly affect the behavior of a program. You can write a program without object-oriented programming, and it will be able to work in exactly the same way as one that is written with object-oriented programming. That said, it can make the program easier to understand and maintain. Programs that are easy to understand and maintain may make your program better in general because it's easier to extend. You can, of course, go overboard with object-oriented programming. You need to think of this as just another set of tools that you can take advantage of when writing code with Python. So in this course, you'll be getting an idea of what object-oriented programming is all about. You'll start to understand why OOP which stands for Object-Oriented Programming, is useful. Every language that uses OOP has slightly different terminology around it. And in this course, you'll be learning all the Python jargon. For instance, in Python, objects are created from classes, which are sort of blueprint for the object. So you'll be creating classes and instances of these classes. You'll be equipping your classes with instance constructors, this will build your objects exactly the way you want them. You'll attach attributes or bits of information to your classes and instances. You'll manipulate your class instances or objects and compare them with each other. And finally, you'll be furnishing your classes and instances with methods and special methods so that they can act when called upon. And with that, let's get stuck in to object-oriented programming in Python. Object-oriented programming is a style of programming. It involves modeling things or concepts with objects. It's a way to group related functionality together. So if you have a bunch of functions that really are all related to a certain concept or thing, it's a nice way to group that together. It's a tool to structure your code. And it's also a skill to practice. The thing with object-oriented programming is that it's a bit of an art. Only with practice do you really start to get a grips with how to structure your programs with objects. You'll also find that no two people structure object-oriented code in exactly the same way. This course is a part of the series Python Basics, and you're going to need IDLE, the integrated development and learning environment that comes packaged with Python. If you're unfamiliar with this, check out one of the first courses in the Python Basics path for how to set up Python and IDLE. If you've got IDLE set up already, then you're ready to get stuck in. Creating a class in Python is not particularly complicated. Here you can see two classes being defined. You start off with the class keyword, and then put in the name of the class. In this case, the class is point. After the name of the class, you can put a colon, and then on a new line that's indented, you can write your class. And in this example, you're just passing the pass keyword, which is like a placeholder. It just means nothing. It just, if you were to leave this blank, that would create an error. But if you leave pass as a placeholder, then you can create this blank class. Down here's another example. You're just changing the name of the class from point to doggo. So let's create a class together here on the idle shell. Remember, you start off with the class keyword and then think of a name. Let's do cat, colon, press enter. That starts an indented line automatically for us. We'll just put in the pass keyword as a placeholder now, press enter a couple more times, and we've got a class. If you just put in cat on the REPL, you'll see that now a identifier for a class comes up on the output. So that is a class. Now you want to bear in mind that classes in Python have a naming convention. You don't have to follow this, 
you can name classes in whatever way you want. But there are a lot of people using classes, and there is a convention that is called capitalized words, or also camel case, or also Pascal case. Every word is capitalized, including the first letter. There's no underscore between words. You just start with a new capital letter. Camel case is sometimes understood as the first starting word not having a capital letter, but camel case is often used in both situations. In any case, the key thing to take away from this is that when you're creating a class, the convention is to start off with a capital letter, and then every word after that starts with a capital letter, no underscore or space between the words. Object-oriented programming in Python means working with classes. To understand both object-oriented programming and classes, we need to understand why we might use them. When you're programming a larger application that works with data, maybe different kinds of data, these questions may arise. How do you store the data while the program's running? Do you keep it in a list? Do you keep it in a dictionary? Do you just make a load of variables? How do you store that? Where do you write the code? So if your code operates on data, where do you place that code? Do you just keep all the functions close by? Do you just put it all in one big file? Do you separate out the different types of data into different types of file? How do you operate on that data? So do you just create copies of lists? How do you know whether one dictionary represents one kind of data or another? Do you have some kind of check to make sure if they have certain properties? And where do you put that code that operates on certain data? Again, do you split that up into files? Do you just keep it all together with comments? These are all things that classes can really help with. Now again, classes really are to make our life easier as a developer. Doesn't mean you have to use them everywhere, but there are many situations in which classes can be really helpful to make your code easier to understand, easier to reason about, and easier to write. Let's take an example. Say you have three people here, and you have data associated with these people. In this example, they're just kept in lists. So for instance, you have Kirk here, and you can tell by the list what's going on. The first item seems to be the name, the full name. The second item is probably the age. The third item is the role. And the fourth item, we're not really sure what it is. Maybe it's an ID number. Now, that seems to be true for the second item as well, where you have Spock, you have the name first, then the age, role, and some kind of ID number. In the last one, though, there's something odd going on. It seems to go straight from the name to the role. Now, this can present a very tricky problem if you're storing your data this way. Because how do you know immediately whether items are missing? You could look at the length, or you could check that the second item is a number. That said, those types of operations are very prone to errors because maybe your list size changes or you have an extra field and where do you put that field? Things can get messy very quickly. Not to mention when you're actually trying to reference this data, looking at the code that references a list, it just says Kirk, open square brackets, number one, close square brackets. That doesn't really tell you a lot about what's happening here. And as you've seen before, the result is that for Kirk and Spock, you get 34 and 35, which seem like reasonable ages. But then for McCoy, you're getting chief medical officer, which is clearly not an age. Whereas if you had used classes, you're going to get into actually how to do that later on in the course. But if you'd used classes, the same operation would look something like this. You have Kirk.age, and this immediately tells you, I'm getting the age from Kirk. This returns 34. 35 in the case of Spock, and in McCoy, it will give you an attribute error because it's saying, I don't have the age for McCoy. Whereas with the list, it would just return a string value, and it's not really telling you anything about the object itself, the person that it represents. Let's look at another example, one that may be a bit more practical. Say you are drawing things or you're just keeping track of positions in two-dimensional space. You might have an x1 variable and a y1 variable to subtract the x and y position. You may decide to keep this in a tuple, the first item being the x position and the second item being the y position. Now for simple operations, this might work just fine. You index point zero and you get one, that's the x, and you index point one and you get two, that's the y. 
But even still, looking at this code, you're not really sure what's going on. Maybe point is actually a list of different points, and point zero means the first point, and point one means the second point. If someone's not familiar with your code, they might get confused by looking at it. And you yourself might get confused, because it's very common for programmers to write something, come back a week later, and not have any memory of what they wrote. So do yourself a favor in these kinds of situations and use objects where your code can look like this. Point dot x is one, point dot y is two. Immediately this code is much less ambiguous because you can see that you are referencing the x attribute of point and the y attribute of point. So now you have some idea of why you need classes. They're a convenient structure to store and operate on data. It makes it easier to reference stuff in code, and it makes it easier to read the code and understand what it's doing. It's also a convenient structure to encapsulate code, as you'll come to see later in the course. It gives you somewhere to place all this code that is related to this type of data. In a nutshell, you need classes to make your life as a developer easier. Now, I'll say this one last time, you can overdo classes. Classes aren't for every single situation. The great thing about Python is that you can use a bit of object-oriented programming and a bit of other types of programming as well. If classes and object-oriented programming make sense for your current problem, go ahead and use them. But if you don't feel like they make sense, then experiment without using them. The key is to be able to use them if you want to and to understand all the great things that they can bring to you as a developer. Class and instance. Let's clear up those terms a little bit because you'll be working very heavily with classes and instances, and it's very important that you have a clear idea of what each means. A class you can think of like a blueprint. You can think of it like a prototype or a model. The instance, on the other hand, is a specimen or a occurrence or an occasion. So in the case of a blueprint, you'd have a blueprint maybe for a car, and the instance would be the actual car. Let's look at a few examples. Here you have classes on the left and examples of the instances on the right. So as a class, you could have the mammal, Canis familiaris, also known as dogs. And the instance of this class could be your dog, Spike. Likewise, you can have the concept of a point in two-dimensional space with an X and Y coordinate. And then you can have an instance of a point, which is the center of a canvas that you're going to draw on. Again, you can have the idea of a chair. So everyone knows what a chair is. It's something that you can sit on. But the instance is the actual chair or the many chairs that are available for you to sit on. Just to hammer this home, a class is like a blueprint and an instance is something that is made from a blueprint. Now, all of these analogies and examples are just to help you really understand the difference between classes and instance when it comes to Python. Remember that analogies are limited. None of these analogies really fully encapsulate everything that goes into a Python class and instance. Once you have a class, you can then instantiate it. So in this example on screen right now, you have class point and you're passing. So it's just a blank class. And you take the name of the class and you add some brackets next to it. Just a quick note on terminology here. When I say brackets, I mean round brackets or parentheses. If we come across square, curly, or angled brackets, I'll explicitly say so. But if I just say brackets, I'm referring to round brackets or parentheses. This instantiates the class. You can do this various times and it will create two instances. The default representation of the class, which is the string between the two chevrons, says that the point object is at this long number, which just refers to its memory address. And as you can see, these two point instances have two different addresses, indicating that they are two different instances of the point class. Carrying on from before, you have your cat class. You evaluated just the cat part of the class, but if you were to take cat and add the two brackets as if you were calling a function at the end of it, then you get your cat object with the memory address. And if you do that again, you'll get a new one. 
And you can do that as many times as you want. That's the beautiful thing about classes is that you can create many instances of the class and they'll all share some attributes, but they'll all be unique in the sense that they live at separate places. And so you can operate them independently if you want to. Empty classes like this do have their uses just as a sort of name for things. But in general, you'll be wanting to add things to your classes, attributes, methods, all these things are going to come up soon. And in the next few lessons, you're going to learn how to add just those things.